who God has called, appointed, anointed, and assigned for such a time as this. And God will awaken you at whatever hour is necessary to get your attention. Can I get a witness from here? I mean, the presidential candidates are talking about who can get the 3 a.m. call. Sometimes God calls you at 3 p.m. and 1 p.m. Somebody says, I'll be somewhere listening for my name. So here God calls Moses in the middle of the night, said, go down and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. I understand it's not an easy undertaking. In fact, it's a huge undertaking, and I know it's tough, but you and I together, Moses, are a majority. There is nothing that we cannot do together. So go unhesitatingly and give him the directive that I've given you. Let my people go. And by the way, Moses, this is what I'm going to do. I'm not going to take them the short way. I'm going to take them the long way through the wilderness because if I took them the short way, they think there are shortcuts in life, and there are no shortcuts in life. If I took them the short way, some would turn back to where I just delivered them from. God wants you to know that you can be delivered, but there are no shortcuts to your deliverance. So we find a people, families, some a single family unit, some with a mother, father, children. We find families who have been together, oppressed in Egypt for all these years. They are used to not living with luxuries. They are used to living without on low budgets. Sometimes they hate to make brick without straw. They didn't have all the resources. There were no food stamps. They're used to living like it, and they've gotten by for all these years. But some folk don't want to leave what they knew. And so some begin to leave reluctantly because a certain bad past is better than an uncertain good future to some. And so God says, look, Moses, trust me. I'm going to get you through this, and I'm going to get them through this. They're going to have to learn how to trust me too. There will be manna provided when necessary. Everything you need is going to be there for you. But at this moment, they've got to leave the situation they're in because I've got a better future for them. And so when God wakes us up, when God stirs us up, he begins us on a journey of what I call liberation. Say liberation. Liberation is the process of being freed from that which has oppressed us, that which chained us. And so God said, I'm taking them on a journey. They don't even know where it's going, but I've got a promised land for them. I've got a promise for them. They are destined for greatness, but they've got to leave the mess that they're in. And don't you know that God can take you from messed up to blessed up? Can I get a witness up in here? But in every generation and every journey of liberation, there's also what we call agitation. Say agitation. That's where God begins to wrestle some things inside of you. And God will use some people to mess you up sometimes. And so there's agitation. These are people here now with an attitude, some in the attitude. And they're saying, look, why didn't you just leave us alone? Didn't you know we were well off where we were? We were better off than Egyptians, and you taking us somewhere we don't even know? And so there's agitation. Sometimes I used to be around folk like that who like to agitate. Every time you're trying to go somewhere, they got something to say about it. You got to kick them to the curb in the name of the Lord. Can I get a witness? People who are trying to hold you back and suck the very life out of you. There's a songwriter who said, na, 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 hey, 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 goodbye. Come on, somebody. <laughs> agitators, agitators. But there's also going to be a word of confirmation. Say confirmation. God will confirm that you're on the right track because the confirmation is when people are mumbling and grumbling and talking about you, that means you're doing something good. Come on, somebody. You'll notice they never say anything about anybody who's not going anywhere, but as soon as you declare, I'm on the battlefield for my Lord, I promised him that I would serve him till I die, all kind of mess breaks out. Can I get a witness? Here you are on fire for the Lord, and some will try to be firefighters and put your fire out. You have to say, this joy I have, the world didn't give, and I won't let you take it away. Come on, somebody. Confirmation. I'm on the right track. And so then they find themselves in the wilderness, in the wilderness, in the wilderness. God says, I'm taking you the long way in the wilderness. And so now they are at the Red Sea. There is a Red Sea in front of them. There is wilderness all around them, and there are enemies pursuing them from the back. Wilderness all around them. 
The long way, Red Sea in front of them and enemies pursuing them. This is not a pretty moment. It's what preachers call being between a rock and a hard place. Anybody ever been there between a rock and a hard place? You never took a drink in your life, but you got an alcoholic in your family. You between a rock and a hard place. Okay, single sisters, you got two men interested in you. One's at your house eating a piece of pound cake. The other's on the cell phone saying, I'm on my way over. You between a, a rock and a hard place. Anybody ever been there? Here they were. Between a rock and a hard place, Red Sea in front, wilderness all around them, enemies pursuing them, and that's when God sends revelation. Say revelation. That's when God begins to reveal some things to you you didn't even know. He started showing Moses who the weak ones were, who the ones who will talk about them even in your face. Who are the ones who will stab you in the back and God will give you revelation as you go through life? You got to stand still long enough to hear what God is saying, but God will give you revelation. Moses, that's not one you want to give the keys to the kingdom. That's not one you want to make your assistant pastor. Moses, these are the ones I wanted you to see so you know as you go on the journey who you need to watch out for. Hello, somebody. And so then there's a word of revelation, but then there's a word of salvation. Moses! Why are you crying out to me? I didn't make you a whiner. I'm trying to make you a winner. There's no room for whiners in the kingdom, somebody. This is a moment for what we call frontline faith. And frontline faith demands warriors and not wimps. Turn and ask somebody, are you a wimp or are you a warrior? I need you. To be a frontline faith leader. So stand still, fear ye not, and see the salvation of the Lord, which I'm going to show you today. I'm in the miracle working business. God does some of his best work when it looks like obstacles in our life. Can I get a witness? Don't cry out to me. Tell the people to go forward. Tell them to go forward. Give them a word of going forward. They cannot go back to where I just delivered them from. Go forward. The word of God, the move of God is always a forward movement. That's why Paul says, I press toward the mark of the upward calling of God in Christ Jesus. You got to move forward. And this is a ministry that's moving forward. It was brilliant for Bishop to say, come as you are today, dress down so that families could come the way they were with the, what they had in their closet and not feel like they're left out. It's an on in season ministry. Any ministry that tries to take you back to where the things used to be is an out of season ministry. Tell the people to go forward because there are seasons and cycles and times of life. That's why the ecclesiastical writer says to everything, there's a season and a time for every matter under the heavens. There's a time to be born, there's a time to die. There's a time to plant, there's a time to pluck up that which is planted. That's why we don't want our little girls wearing makeup too soon. Not a time to be a woman yet. Be a little girl as long as you can be a little girl. You got the rest of your life to be grown, but be a little girl, be a little boy. Don't be mannish, don't be womanish. By the same token, it's not time anymore for elders to wear mini skirts. That season's over. Say hello, somebody. Yeah, cover it. I know, I know. Cover it up. You may have had legs. Now they look like chitlins. Cover them up. Cover them up. Cover them. Cover them. Up. So here we are. Tell them to go forward. They cannot go back. And you know, in our communities, in our families, sometimes we want to go back and we got drama, especially at funeral time. Somebody dies in the family, ain't Mamie dies, and she didn't leave you your $60 and you tripping at her funeral. Turn and tell somebody, forget about it. She ain't coming back. Let her rest in peace. We can't go back. Single sisters want to go back. I used to like him and I wanted him to marry me. He's 82 on a cane, toothless, got eight babies all over the world. Say, thank God for Jesus I didn't go back. I ain't going back. I ain't looking back. I ain't trying to grab back. I'm going forward, baby. So then God speaks to Moses. They're now on a purpose. 
personal relationship. Mo! Yes, there's the Red Sea in front of you. Yes, there's wilderness all around you. Yes, there are enemies pursuing you, but no weapon formed against you is gonna prosper as long as I'm in this thing. Mo! Use what's in your hands. I place something in your hands, and every family member has something placed in your hands. No matter how old, how young, you've got something in your hands. What you have is not what I have, and what I have is not what you have, but everybody's got something in your hand. What you have may not see much, but when you yield it to God's touch, your life will never be the same. Slap somebody high five and say, I know that's right, I know that's right. And if you don't have everything in your hands that you think you should have, you have not because you ask not. Ask God for what you think you're lacking in. You know, as a pastor, I said of three congregations in New York City, as Bishop shared with you. And at the last one, we used to walk for our tithes and offering. And um, so I used to see many people were huffing and puffing. And I had gotten, gained so much weight. You ever gain so much weight, you think somebody's following you, but it's you? I was like, OMG. It was like goodness and mercy following me all the days of my life. I said, we got to do something about this. And so I started this initiative, I called it Fine, Fit, and Fabulous. And it became a national model for churches all over. It was a health ministry so that we could start living and not dying. Because I'd be preaching up here, and downstairs they'd have slabs of ribs and macaroni and cheese while I'm talking about health. You know, we have to have those four cheeses. We got to have sharp cheddar, mild cheddar, mozzarella, and the welfare cheese. Come on. You know that makes the best macaroni. It's better than Velveeta, baby, yeah. So in order to deal with this crisis, as pastor, I had to be the leader of this flock, and we were going to do something about this weight gain and about living and about healthy eating and healthy living. And so what we started doing was when we had repasts and we had little affairs, we would take the ham hock and the fat back out of vegetables, and sometimes they put tofu in there. And then they start putting out celery and carrots and peppers and dips instead of the cheese and all that. So as the pastors, they would come to me, they say, how are you doing, Pastor? Very well, thank you so much. This is so delicious. Can you pass me another piece of celery, please? <laughs> but I must tell you, after six months, I was hungry. OK, I was hungry. I, I, you know, I'm a carnivore all the way to my very soul. I was missing me some meat. So this is what happens. In New York City, in the Bronx, you know, sometimes we got gates on, on the outside of our churches. We don't have a cathedral like this. So to lock up, they got to pull the gates down and put the locks up. So usually I would leave and the deacons would take care of all of that. But this particular night, I'm sitting in my car on my cell phone and the deacons say, okay, good night, Pastor. Yo no, that's okay. Y'all take care, brothers. I'll be all right. You gonna be all right? I'm gonna be all right. Y'all go on, go on, go on. So there are only two drive-throughs in the Bronx, New York. There's White Castle, and there's Burger King, okay? Soon as those brothers left, I made a beeline to Burger King, baby. I came in there about 80 miles an hour. They said, look, miss, what you have? And I said, look, I know you can hold the pickles and you can hold the lettuce and special orders don't accept us. But I said, if I'm going down, give me the works, brother. Give me a double burger with cheese, extra ketchup, extra mayo, extra mayo, extra mustard, and cut it in half, because I'm a Whopper woman. Give me the works. And that's how I've learned to approach God. I say, God, any way you want to bless me, I'll be satisfied. But give me the works. Give me looks. Give me figure. Give me intelligence. Give me a man. Give me romance. Give me finance. Any way you want to bless me, I'll be satisfied. Are there any Whopper women, Whopper men in the house? Say, God, give me the works. Give me the works. You have not, because you have not give me the works. Mo, I placed a staff in your hand. And if you'll lift it and stretch it, I 
can do miracles with you. Because your job is to help the people get to the other side. And when Moses lifted the staff and stretched it out, the sea opened up. And God's people made it to the other side on dry land. Dry land, dry land. And on this family day, that's what God wants you to know, families, that there is another side. Yes, it feels like there's a Red Sea and obstacles all in your path, but God says there's another side. There's another side to your pain, another side. Another side to your divorce, another side. Another side to your loss. There's another side. I'm trying to tell somebody there's another side. I'm praying for you to get to the other side. There's another, another side. That's why I flew all the way from the East Coast to the West. God wants you to know there's another side. Yes, you have been struggling, but God says now it's time for strengthening. I'm giving you muscle. I'm giving you power. I'm giving you an energy. I'm giving you anointing to get. to the other side. So after the liberation and the agitation and the word of salvation and the confirmation, now it was time for celebration. Say celebration. It said, Pastor Bishop Moses and the sisters Miriam and the others grabbed their tambourines and they began to dance to celebrate the goodness of the Lord. That's what Sunday morning is really all about. It's about dancing before the Lord. It's about celebrating that he blessed you not only last Sunday, but Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. You're here another Lord's Day. Somebody say celebrate. That's why I can't, I can't understand when people just sit quiet. This is not a cutie pie convention. After all the Lord's been doing for you, has done for you, somebody ought to take the time out and say, praise the Lord. See, if it was a Friday night, I see some of you on the dance floor on Friday night doing the boogaloo, doing the wobble. But God said it's Sunday morning, slide to the right two times. Everybody clap your hands. Is there anybody here that loves my Jesus? Is there anybody here that loves my Lord? Come on, wave your hands in the air. Just wave them like you just don't care. If you love the Lord and you feel all right, let me hear you say, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving. I will enter his gates with praise. I will be thankful unto him and bless his name for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. Say yeah. I know it's family day, but this is celebration day. This is celebration day, amen. Take your seats, take your seats, take your seats. On the other side. I kept wondering why God said, um, that Joseph said, take my bones with you. It's because the ancestors wanted to be there to celebrate the things that couldn't happen in their own life. And so Joseph said, take me with you. I couldn't see it in my lifetime but I know you're gonna see it in your lifetime. So when you see it, I wanna be with you. So I, I wear my mother's jewelry, that's my ancestors being with me. I have my daddy's height, that's my ancestors being with me. So every time I preach, I, I've got my parents with me, my late parents with me. And so I want to, what we call represent. So that when I walk in doors, I'm representing not just y'all, but I'm representing my mother and my father and all the big mamas and big daddies who couldn't do what we did and couldn't go where we went and can't sing what we say. I represent. Turn and tell somebody you got to represent. You got to represent. So here Moses and Miriam are celebrating. And I took myself back to a time and asked myself, do I celebrate? all that God's done for me? Well, I had the privilege of working for two presidents of the United States. God's been so good to me. A girl from a walk-up tenement, 133 West 144th Street, being able to go in the White House. God's been good to me. And so a few years ago, it was during the presidential primaries, just like it is now, and one of the former presidents called me and said, look, I need your help. I know you've got Ken from 
North Carolina, and so I need you to help us. Now, my late parents, Dorothy and Wilbur Johnson, were Southern parents. They were Southerners who, in the 50s, moved up to New York City. They were part of that black migration. Some went north, some came cross country, some went up to Chicago. My parents went to New York, and so my brother and I are the beneficiaries of their goodness and their work and their hard work. They went there as poor people, but they worked together and built a business so we could be strong, and so I realize I'm the beneficiary. But they started in the fields of North Carolina. Sharecroppers picking cotton and tobacco in this generation, picking cotton and tobacco. And so one thing they wanted us to know was the history of where we came from. So in New York, schools would go to the last day of June. Whatever the last day of June was business day, we would go to school into the end of that day. We'd go there, get our report cards, and then we'd have our talent show in the middle of the day. we put a record player on. Now, some of y'all don't remember records, but we had a record player. It had Motown in the middle of it, and it had a little disc in the middle of that, and then we put a dime on the needle <laughs> to hold it down so it wouldn't skip. Then we put on our Apple Jacks, and we'd be Michael Jackson and the Jackson Five, and then we put on Diana Ross and the Supremes. Guess who was Diana Ross? Stop. In the name of love, before you break my heart, think it over, haven't I been good to you? Then we'd get our report cards and we'd go home and our parents would have a suitcase ready for us because they would send us what they called down south so that we might learn about our maternal and our paternal grandparents. And so we'd be on a bus, either Greyhound where they left the driving to us or Trailways. I was a Trailway baby. And so we would ride all night. We'd have a shoebox filled with fried chicken wrapped in aluminum foil, pound cake, come on baby. You're looking at a pound cake, mama. Every pound came from a piece of pound cake. Then we have ham sandwiches on white Wonder Bread with mayonnaise. And we freeze the sodas all night long. And we get down to Monroe, North Carolina. There my grandmother be waiting there for me. And next to her would be her sister, Bess. And then there'd be three cousins. They all had double names. Bessie May and Lula May and <laughs> Willie Joe and Big Boy. And then at the end would be Aunt Miss. Aunt Miss was a snuff dipping aunt. So she'd have snuff juice all down her chin. They said, come on, give everybody a kiss. I said, I ain't kissing Aunt Miss. They said, I'm gonna get my switch. You won't have to get the whole tree, cause I, this is post-traumatic stress for a kid. Then we ride into town, into Concord. And they had rocking chairs on the porch, and they'd be rocking. They either had lemonade or sweet tea. I realized why they called it sweet tea, because they poured a five-pound bag of sugar in the sweet tea. I used to think they were rocking because of the rocking chairs. They were rocking because of the sugar. But they didn't know what day it was, where they was. They said, Ronnie and Susie are here. OK, OK. Go kill one of the chickens. I will have some food tonight. Then we go inside and it'd be a black and white TV, nine inch, with five channels. They take the foil from the chicken and they put it on the antenna. So we get a satellite. Come on, am I the only one? Don't try to perpetrate. You ain't always had a 52 inch color TV plasma screen. And then at nine o'clock, the flag would come on with God bless America. But on Sunday morning, we go to a church, a small church about the size of this section, Black's Memorial, and in the last row would be the mothers, and they start singing, I come to the garden alone, while the dew is still on the roses, and the voice I hear calling on my ear, the Son of God discloses, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own, and the joy we share as we tarry there. So they, they would show us some wonderful sights of our relatives, before we had digital technology, we would talk to each other. And they show us the fields where my mother used to have to pick cotton and tobacco on her knees, the red clay hills of North Carolina. So fast forward, this president calls me, says, I know you got relatives in North Carolina. You got history there, you got roots there. I need you to help me. That's the one state we don't have a hold on. So I was pastoring at the time. They wanted me to come on a Sunday. I said, look, 
can't come to church is over. Okay, sure enough, there's a ticket waiting for you. LaGuardia Airport. Get to LaGuardia Airport. Sure enough, there's a ticket for me waiting at LaGuardia Airport. In those days, they had jerry curls. The man's jerry curl juice was dripping on my ticket. But I was like, come on, brother. Come on, brother. Give me this ticket. What gate am I going to? Okay. So we fly in one of them little itty bitty planes and we land in Elizabeth City, North Carolina. Oh, the Secret Service met me. They had their credentials. They were working that day because it was a white president. They had everything together. <laughs> Here, Miss Johnson, Cook, here's your credentials and this is your assignment today. You are going to introduce the president. He's going to introduce his candidate. That's all we need you to do all day long. I'm going to introduce the president. He's going to introduce his candidate. You got it? You got it? I got it. I got it. So the president's getting ready to come down. They said, okay, now go get in the limousines. They're outside. So I go in the first limousine. They said, that's the president's. Don't get it twisted. I was like, okay. <laughs> Limo number two, here I come. So I sit there. They said, okay, we're going by motorcade. We're going to make several stops. You got your assignment, I've got my assignment. So I'm in the motorcade, I'm in the back seat of the limousine, I'm digging the scene with my preacher lean. I was like, yeah. People were waving on both sides. I was like waving back, God bless America. Y'all don't know me, but I'm up in here. Yeah. So we're going, going down the center aisle. Motorcades are cycling, the sirens are going on. We're going in our limos. We get to Elizabeth State University. I jump out, I'm ready, I'm pumped. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Thank you, Sujay. All right, we do two more stops. He says, you know what, we can't cover the whole state by motorcade, so we're gonna have to get on my plane. So we're going to my plane now. Yes, sir, we'll go. So we get on in the limousines. He goes out to this place where his plane is parked, and we get in this plane. There's a four-seater. Two seats facing each other. The president's in one, the governor's in one, a mayor's in one, and I'm in seat number four. I said, my Lord, what a morning. So I'm sitting diagonally across from the president and he's trying to make me comfortable. He's talking to me, I'm a professional speaker. All I could think of saying was yes. He said, could you say a little more? I said, yes, sir. He says, okay. He says, buckle up now. We're getting ready to take off. Here comes the pilot. So up on the plane steps this black male pilot. 6'3", tall, dark, and handsome. He steps up on the plane. Now, you know when there are only two black people, you just try to make eye contact. <laughs> you really want to say, umkawa, but you can't. Never let them see you sweat. Never let them see you emote. So I'm like, you got me? I got you, okay. <laughs> Brother, fly this plane. So we get to three fields we stop in where the plane lands. The first is in New Bern, North Carolina. The people are there with their signs for their candidate. Here comes the president. Ladies and gentlemen, the president of the United States, the applaud. We go to field number two up near Raleigh, Durham. Ladies and gentlemen, the president of the United States, the applaud. We get to field number three. It's right outside Charlotte, North Carolina. That's where my mother was picking cotton and tobacco. I'm standing in the fields where she had to kneel on her knees. Here's a woman who had to pick cotton and tobacco in the blazing sun on her knees. Here her daughter is standing on her feet in a place where she knelt down. She struggled, but here I was being strengthened. She was on her knees and had to use an outhouse. But here her daughter is with someone from the White House. Come on, what a mighty God we serve. Heaven and earth adorn. Angels bow before him. What a mighty God we serve. But I thank God she was a praying mama. And I imagine she was praying one day my kids won't have to pick cotton. One day my kids won't have to pick tobacco. One day my kids won't have to be on their knees cleaning somebody's house. And because she prayed for me, had me on her mind, took the time and prayed for me, I'm so glad she prayed. Is there anybody here that had a praying mama? Is there anybody here that had a praying daddy? Aren't you glad they prayed? So when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah, praise God for saving me, cause can't nobody do me like Jesus, can't nobody do me like the Lord. Yes, I've had some struggles, but I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Is there anybody here?
Sing it later. Say yeah. Say yeah. The songwriter said, I've had some good days. I've had some hills to climb. Struggle. But he said, all my good days, strength, outweigh my bad days, struggle. So he said, I won't complain. Say yeah. Say yeah. Do me, do me, do me like Jesus say, yeah. I'm strengthened by my struggles and my trials only come to make me strong through it all. Through it all, through it all. I've learned to trust and depend on his word. Say hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs>